So um, hopefully the mic will stay up, but um, there's something about these wireless mics that, that's not immediately obvious to people who aren't in the industry of like presenting or whatever. Apparently, the radio frequency spectrum that these things are on is slightly illegal in most countries, but everybody kind of just goes past that. And so odd things can interfere with it, and I think it might be the airport that's kicking us. But you know, we never know. If, if it cuts out, I'll just be patient. That's it. Anyway, I'm here to talk about how we build big systems at Wonderlist. How many people here know what Wonderlist is? A fair number. For those that don't, um, Wonderlist is a list-taking application. Now, list-taking applications, there's millions of them out there. They're not all that exciting. But we've done something a little different. We make a list application that can actually share in real time between people and devices. So you can have a shared grocery list with your girlfriend or boyfriend and add things to it as they're way on, on the way to the store, and they'll see those coming in real time, and when you're checking things off, they'll see those again in real time. And so it works well in the personal case. It also works well in, um, in a larger group environment. But I'm not here to sell you on the product. I'm here to tell you about how we built the system on the back end that handles this sync. So... At Wonderlist, we build software that we can throw away. Now, this is kind of a challenging statement because a lot of software developers want to build something that'll last, that's for, for, for the ages. Like, you know, somebody wants to build the C++ compiler, or somebody wants to build Elixir, or somebody wants to build the, the next thing that kills off Ant, or something like that. Um, we actually are going the reverse direction. We are trying to build software that we can continually throw away and reinvigorate. Why is this? It's because we're trying to make a stand for making software that works. As an industry, we are really bad about shipping software. I could throw up all sorts of stats and, and stuff online from different research groups, but, um, but you all know this yourself. How many times have you worked on a project where you were supposed to launch and you slipped, and you were supposed to launch and you slipped, and you were supposed to launch and you slipped? You know, raise your hands if you've ever been on one of those. Um, oh, come on, <laughs> liars. <laughs> now you're punking me. Um, we've, all, we've all been in this, this process. And one of the reasons is that um, the natural process of writing software is towards tightly coupled systems, right? If you sit down and start writing software, you're writing in your favorite language, and you're taking advantage of all the things that you can do in your language. And then you have to get stuff done, so then you do things very fast. And then you're worried about shipping, so your, what started out as maybe a well-architected application becomes a hairball. It's kind of a natural state of software development, especially under deadline pressure. By the time it's obvious that you need to like, rethink or refactor your software, oftentimes you're already so far in the weeds that you are um, seriously in trouble. When we're talking about servers, this kind of trouble means that um, it becomes really hard to deploy new versions of your software. So at Wonderlist, versions 1 and 2 of the back end were built in PHP and then Rails respectively, and these became these huge hairballs. And um, as it became harder to actually get these hairballs running in production, people stopped deploying. And as people stopped deploying on any kind of cycle, the more they got afraid of deploying. And the more they got afraid of deploying, of course, then the more everything slows down. These big hairballs also get into a condition where even if you say, let's do testing, testing is, is the savior for everything. Let's, let's keep it green. Um, I've got lots of thoughts about testing, but testing at its heart is great stuff. It's the right thing to do. But in a big system that turns into a hairball, what will happen and I've seen this dozens of times, is you'll end up with your test matrix, you know, where it's printing out all the red and, blo red and green blobs, and you'll end up with lots of green, but some red. So mostly green, okay, well, we need to get into production, let's ship it. And then you get to a point where you're comfortable with this, or maybe not. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. And you've just defeated the entire purpose of test-driven development and by, by, by doing this, but it happens. And then all this inertia packs up, and technology upgrades themselves become, ex become scary and expensive. So even the process of going from Ruby 1.9 to 2.0 or moving between versions of Rails becomes so scary that people won't do it. 
Um, how many people here use Rails in their, in their systems? How many people are still using a variant of like Ruby 1.8 or 1.9 instead of the latest 2.0? Oh, hey, you're, doing, you're ahead of the curve. <laughs> anyway, to solve this, good programmers will come along, see all this, and build abstractions on top of it. Um, now, of course, those abstractions are really awesome for helping us deal with these things, but they start stacking up. And to borrow, some, borrow a phrase from the, the Java world, what you'll end up with is design pattern soup. Now, um, you, you, you probably have seen this where you have an abstract factory that gets to a concrete factory that then you make an instance of your server and do something with, right? It's, um, it's, it's hellacious. Even if you like design patterns, it turns into soup. The strange thing is not all big systems actually exhibit these kinds of problems. These kinds of problems are um, fairly unique to software, it seems like. For example, think about how you got here today to this, this venue. Um, likely, you took a car down a road um, or a train down a train track, right? Um, the car that you're in may be a new car, maybe an old one. The car next to you could have been ancient. It could have been 50 years old. It could have been 100 years old, and somebody's using the same system, right? So somehow, our interface for transportation is a lot more resilient than anything we do in computing. Another metaphor that we use internally at, at, at uh, Six Wonder Kinder is that of homeostasis. Um, this is a biological metaphor where all the components of your system are actually loosely joined, they're working together, and parts of them are dying all the time, and parts of them are being regenerated all the time. So out of the trillions of cells in your body, millions are dying every second, but that's okay because millions more are coming along together. We have systems in our body like the liver and kidneys that balance each other out. Each does a specific thing in the system, and left to their own devices, they might be toxic to us. But they end up actually helping us by working together. But they're independent, and you can actually, well, you can transplant, and maybe someday you can print kidneys and give somebody a kidney transplant with something artificial and actually improve it. So, you, this works on the big systems, but you can also look down at the very smallest systems that we have in our bodies, cells, right? So what is the software equivalent of a cell, and how can we leverage this metaphor to actually do something reasonable in our practice of building up our system? That was where we started about 18 months ago. So if small is good, what we wanted to do was make small pieces of granular functionality that work together with other pieces. And these pieces could then independently be replenished and replaced without killing off the entire system at once. So we took that as a metaphor and set a few rules. Our first rule is reduce coupling. We had coupling, tight coupling everywhere in our system. Everything was doing its best to be this tightly coupled hairball. And what we did was we drove through a stake and said, OK, we're going to take out all the coupling in the system. We want to re also reduce the fear of deployment. We want to get our engineers deploying on a fast basis. And we want to make it trivial to change anything out. Now, I don't mean change in the sense of changing out a little bit of code or taking a function or taking a method or changing it. I'm talking about taking a complete chunk of the system and making it trivial to change that. So we have a rule, we've taken all these rules and, and, and come up with some, some mandates, right? Um, we have a policy in our company. You can write anything you want in any language you want, as long as it's about yay big. Now, this is kind of abstract and arbitrary to say yay big, but you kind of know what I mean. You can look at it in a couple of minutes on in your code editor, you can fire it up in whatever IDE or whatever you like to use. A lot of our guys use Vim. Some of our guys use Visual Studio. It goes all over the map. But you can look at this code and understand it in the time it takes to drink a coffee. If we, so we set this goal so that if we wanted to, we could use whatever technology was appropriate for the task at hand. And if later we decided that was a bad choice, we could replace it. Or if somebody new to the team came along and did something, looked at something crazy we'd done in, say, Erlang or Elixir, which nobody else on the team actually knew, 
even somebody who didn't know the language could look at this much code and figure out what was going on and replace it in short order. We also came up with another mandate, to write services that document themselves without extensive comments. How many people actually read comments in code anymore? Right? You've got... <laughs> Man, you guys are just like punking me the whole time. Um, <laughs> okay. Most people I know are reading comments. Part of that is that maybe the syntax highlighting in their, in, their, in their code editor is making them go away, or maybe it's color coding them into some place that they just don't even look at anymore. Um, or it could be that if you write out a book of comments, and then your code are these little tiny pieces in and amongst the comments, then you spend all your time looking for the code and actually trying to ignore all the English or Polish or Russian around it. But more to the point, we really have come full circle to believe that the code that we write should document itself. We want code that you can read and you know exactly what it does without reading a comment, unless there's something really tricky or really bizarre or really kind of a gotcha or dragons be here kind of thing. Like if we're trying to do something and we're, it, if you do it the wrong way, which looks obvious, it's a, it's a huge time sink. But if you do it the slightly tricky way that's hard to understand, it runs really fast, okay, comment that and say, yeah, there's, there's something funky here, right? But otherwise, we actually are promoting not doing a lot in the way of comments. And as much as we believe in testing, we are actually not convinced that doing a 100% test code coverage actually buys us as much as people think it does. What that means is that in practice, we do enough TDD to get a service built. In other words, as you're coding, you're using TDD as that conversation that you're having with your code. Like, okay, first I need to write a test because I need to make this chunk of code talk to the database. Okay, how do I mock that? Okay, now that I've figured out how to mock it, now I'm using some sort of pluggable database thing that's probably a good thing, so I'll move on to the next piece and so forth and so forth and so forth. TDD during the development of code is great, but once we actually have a piece of code, we don't care about the test so much anymore. What we care about is how that piece of code actually runs in deployment where we can see it in, in, in action. Like to us, it tells us more about a piece of code when we deploy it and that server is consistently generating 200s than if it starts blowing off 503s, right? If we put something, a piece of code in production and it's a lot of 500s are coming off of it in our server monitoring, well, we know we got a problem, right? And then we go fix it. If it's all 200s, we're in a much better place. We also have put the mandate that services own and encapsulate their data. Now, database weenies, I use that time term lovingly, um, database weenies love to create schemas that are very complex that interact and use relational integrity and foreign key constraints and all sorts of really good stuff from the database world. Unfortunately, most of the apps that we build don't take advantage of this. And what we found is our app didn't take advantage of anything special about relational databases, but we still ended up with a hairball of a database schema. So as we went through and split up our, our, our system into services, we made each service responsible for holding its own data. Now, this means that when we have a service that is talking to data, if we want to change out that from MySQL to Postgres, for example, that's easy to do. Or we can go get fancy with a single part of the system and go to Redis or something NoSQL or Dynamo or whatever, whatever makes sense for that particular component without trying to reflight the entire system. And we also believe in REST everywhere. So if we have a lot of components in our system, if we're looking at how to make dozens and dozens of services talk together because we've broken them apart into these little cells, we need a common interface everywhere. Now, for the gaming company that we heard about earlier, that common interface was a binary protocol. For us, it's JSON over REST. We have mandated everything talks to everything, JSON over REST. And we do this because we're taking that small is better approach to everything we do. The only complicated thing about this particular rule is that HTTP connection latency can get to be a real drag over the open internet, and we wanted to take these idea of, sh of shipping small little pieces of data 
all the way out to our end clients who are operating all across the world, mobile devices, high-end networks, low-end networks, et cetera, et cetera. So we had to actually invent a solution for this little issue. Um, we, uh, we, we wanted to take these small requests out to the clients, and so we took advantage of WebSockets, and we tunneled HTTP over WebSock connections. So what does this look like in practice? We have a client which could be an uh, uh, iOS device, it could be a Mac, it could be a Windows, it could be whatever, establishes a WebSocket connection with a front-end server, and over that connection, it's shipping JSON blobs. Now, in order not to create too much of a, of a distinct protocol from REST, what we did was we simply encapsulated REST in JSON. We issue a HTTP method of git, for example, in this, in this code sample, and we send along the parameters that we need to actually make the request. And then we do one more thing, because WebSockets are asynchronous, and HTTP REST calls assume synchronicity, is we tag it with a header of a request ID so that when the request comes back to, it, to the client, it can be associated with the, what, what sent it, and the client can do the right thing in putting all this data together. Now, this seemed like a straightforward mechanism for, um, for getting out of having high latency over the internet. Turned out there was actually something else that was really tricky about this. It turned our synchronous connection, like I just said, into an asynchronous connection. We could have clients issue out tons of requests asynchronously, and then they could wait for the request to come back, but they didn't have to be managing a whole bunch of connections. They didn't have to manage a whole bunch of state within their devices. And as a result, the clients actually got a little bit simpler because they could behave in the same asynchronous way as the rest of our system. Now, a few people might look at this little example I showed and say, hey, wait, there isn't this thing, HTTP2, coming along that does exactly this? And uh, you're right. Uh, we built this before HTTP2 was finalized, and we're actually really happy about, about that, and we're going to get the heck off of our solution and move on to HTTP2 as soon as we can. But we're really happy to see that happen, and we're, we're really working to get there sooner than later. So that's a little bit about how we connect our clients to our server, but that's not really what I want to talk to you about today. What I want to talk to you about is the back end, right? So I've told you all of our rules. I've told you our rules about, um, about the way we break up services and users rest everywhere. We have another rule, and that's we are heterogeneous by default. We don't have a favorite language at Wonderlist. Um, I have a favorite language, or three. Chad, my CTO, has a favorite language, or five. Everybody knows a whole bunch of languages on our system. Um, this is kind of a partial list. We use Ruby, Haskell, Scala, Clojure, Go, JavaScript, Lua, Elixir, Erlang, and so many more on the back end. It, it, it's kind of scary. But this is another one of our rules. And what it lets us do is have an architecture that looks like this. Now, apologies for throwing up a whole bunch of boxes on the screen, but this is what our back end looks like. At the very top, whoops, I'm trying to get the little laser pointer, the fancy little laser pointer here. At the top, uh, our, our normal HTTP REST endpoint and our web, WebSocket handler. This is what all the clients talk to. The HTTP server is basically Nginx that has uh, Lua in it to do all of our routing. Pretty simple standard stuff. Our WebSocket server, on the other hand, is in Scala. It's built on top of Akka Actors. And this is what is actually used for, by most of our clients to issue most of their requests. So when a client hooks up to our server and starts issuing requests, like get this list or get this task or get this whatever it is, this WebSocket server is catching that request and then sending it on down through our stack. Now, each part of our system, each part of our API, is a different service. So if you think about the data model that you would need for a task app, right, a to-do app, you probably have things like lists, tasks, reminders, uh, due dates, um, all the little pieces you would typically decompose your application into a data model. Each one of those is a different, is a different service on our back end. So every list comes from the list service. Every task comes from the task service. Every user is held by the user service, right? And it's a straightforward linear breakout. 
The next thing we've done is break the stack into two layers. The first layer is what we call the business logic layer. Internally, we give all these services English names. We're based in Berlin, so we had to come up with a cute little naming schema. So all of our front-end sy systems, like the thing that handles tasks, is called tasks. Or the thing that's called users is called users. Now, those are handling whether or not a, a user is allowed to access a re uh, resource and what to do and all the complicated business logic. Then it turns around to the next layer down, which is our German layer. Um, so users has a paired service called Burgeramt, right? If you move to Berlin, you have to go register yourself as a citizen in the city of Berlin at the Burgeramt. And so we called our um, user registry Burgeramt. And that is what then takes a request, turns it into the CRUD commands necessary to talk to the database. And then each of those is a separate database. So tasks is in its own database, users is in its own database, reminders is in its own database, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when we launched this last summer, this was most, most of the pieces of our system were Ruby on Rails. Um, this is what our software developers understood innately. It's, um, it's obviously a great technology, but we had a few services that needed a little extra oomph. So we have one service in particular. It's called our root service. So in order for us to make real-time sync work, we need a way for the clients to say, what is my current status, i.e., what is the revision ID of my entire world view? And we keep that data in a root service, and that root service has to be able to respond instantaneously and fast so that a client can check in, say, hey, do I have anything? And the root service return response will either say that they need to do a full sync or, nope, you don't have anything to do. And Ruby on Rails wasn't fast enough to cut it for us. And so then we prototyped it in Go. And Go wasn't quite fast enough for us. So we had one guy on our team, Brian, he's, uh, he's a crazy kid. He's in his upper 20s, sparkles in his eyes about all sorts of crazy languages. And he's like, I want to build this in Haskell. And uh, a few of us were like, really? Um, but Chad reminded us of our rule, you can write anything you want to if it's yay much code, right? Because if it turns out to be bad, we'll just replace it. And so we let him go off and write this in Haskell. And actually, a couple other people in our group decided to do different languages, and we had a bake-off with which thing, which service could actually turn and get a value out of Redis faster and shove it back to the client. And so we had Haskell versus Go versus Node versus Rails versus God only knows what else. And it turned out Haskell won. So we deployed it. And when we launched, we had Haskell as this very important piece of the architecture. We also had a couple of Go services and some Node services. Now, a place where we weren't on the Ruby kind of ba bandwagon is in our messaging servers. So we have a messaging layer that communicates when something gets changed, when you update a task or you update something, there's this fan out process that needs to happen in our system to make sure all the other pieces are kept in sync. And we've run this through a Rabbit MQ server that's controlled by closure. So already last year we had one, two, three, four, five, six or seven different languages going on in our, in our application. We launched, and uh, everything worked well, thankfully. A um, couple of days after we launched, RDS crashed on us, and that's a different problem. But at least our code worked really well. And as people started flooding into the system and as our numbers went, went up like this, um, we started finding out the parts of our system that weren't uh, as robust as we had hoped they were. And so we started replacing them. And what we did is we started going through all of our English services. And wherever we had a server that was having a hard time, we replaced it with something written in Scala. And in our data access logic layer, wherever we were having a server that was a hard time, especially with reads, we replaced it with closure, which is really fast. And so nine months later, this is representative of what our system architecture looks like. We have a little bit of Ruby on Rails still in that front end services, but mostly it's Scala. And in the data access layer, it's mixed between Rails and Clojure. And we've, if I flip back, you'll see we've actually swapped out one of the databases with, uh, to Postgres. 
and more of these swap outs will happen. So the beautiful thing about this is we haven't had to ship a big version of our system in order to do this. We ship little tiny pieces of the system every single day, and we change them out as we go because we can. Everybody on our team is perfectly allowed to go rewrite something, deploy it to production, and, and, and find out what happens. And by doing so, we have totally taken away fear of deployment. We've totally taken away the stasis that we get into when we have the big hairball. Now we have a different problem. That is, we have lots of different services running. We have, at any one time, hundreds of machines going. But that's not the same problem as having a hairball of code. So after this experience, we kind of have a, a few guidelines on how we use technologies. For Ruby on Rails, we, use, we now look at it as a production quality prototyping tool. The first iteration of anything that we write is probably going to be in Rails because it's easy to do. You know, Rails new, blah, blah, blah. And tinker around with it a little bit, get it going, push it out, find out if it's actually worth doing or not. Once we find the, as the services that really rock, but they need a little more help, they need to be faster, then we turn to Go and Scala and Clojure for when we want these things to fly. Um, for some reason, uh, Scala and Clojure have really taken off in popularity in our company. The JVM languages, as much as it's fun to bag on Java, um, that runtime is really, really pretty amazing. And then finally, when we're really in need of rockets, when we're really in need of something crazy, we have the internal permission to use those. We, like I said, we have Haskell in our system. And a few parts of our admin system, we're now using Elixir and Erlang. And we'll probably have a lot more of that coming. Furthermore, as we look to the future, maybe we'll end up with something crazy like deploying some services in C Sharp or F Sharp or something else that's totally nutty, at least if you think in terms of I only deploy to Unix-based systems in monoliths, right? If you have that mindset, you can't take advantage of whatever else comes along. But with our mindset, we're ready for that and actually kind of itching to do something. There's another aspect, though, of what, we've, of what we found to doing this particular little um, adventure. Using all these languages has actually served as a forcing function for keeping things deadly simple. For example, if you're spending all of your time working in Ruby, you're going to go down the Ruby path. You're going to get into all the cute things you can do with Ruby. You might start monkey patching. You're going to take this piece and do this fancy little thing. That's one of the ways, in retrospect, that we found that we introduced hairballs into our code. Same thing happens with Scala. Oh, god, it happens a lot in Scala. Scala is a fantastic language, but you can do it anything you want into it, any which way you want it to. And um, what we're finding is that people take advantage of the full breadth of Scala, and all of a sudden they create a Scala hairball. We think that this happens in every language. So by forcing multiple languages into our system, it makes us keep true to the fact that we use REST everywhere. We use a simple protocol composed of JSON over HTTP between our systems. And we therefore don't let ourselves fall in the trap of getting cute with our languages. So what's next? What comes, um, what comes after this? Well, the first thing we want to do, let me turn off the laser pointer, um, is implement self-regulation. So we've had great success by taking this biological metaphor and saying we have all these thousands of cells that we have running in our system, and parts of them we're taking out all the time and replacing. But we still have humans in the loop. We still have humans watching graphs in Labrado to make sure everything's happy. When, uh, when we go through our daily demand curve, we have to look at it and say, oh, are we getting close to a maximum somewhere? And then adjust. We want to take that out of the system and actually have these components start talking to each other 
and saying, look, the load's going up. Maybe we need to scale up the task service, and maybe we need to scale up uh, BurgerAmp, and maybe we need to scale up all the other pieces that usually get loaded down when we see this stuff coming in from the front end. Or on the flip side, we want to get to the point where we can save money. And like, if the services aren't being used, we start scaling them down, but they can bounce back automatically. We're also looking at using spot instances. So we have this idea that we can replace any part of our system at any time. The next step of this is to go steal um, something out of Pinterest playbook and say, OK, if we're going to assume we can replace anything at any time, let's actually force that. Let's actually deploy all of our servers using Amazon spot instances so that, A, we can save money by using cheap resources when possible, but B, we can also force ourselves back into even more the mode of our services are transient and will go away and be replaced with something else. We're going to look in the future a lot more at actors. Actors in our Scala-based um, WebSocket connection system have been actually kind of mind-bending. When I was doing the load testing before we launched the system, I wrote a tool called Bozigurken. Now, Bozigurken, if you know German, you're saying, why are you saying evil cucumbers? Um, we, had, we, we built these evil cucumbers that would actually go and attack our system. And they would do so, so effectively that when they went through the WebSocket connection, the WebSocket could hand out requests to our backend services so fast that we could crush everything like a tin can. And we had to go in and actually put in serious throttles into our ACA system so that we could slow that down so it wouldn't crush the back end. And we've done a good job of that, but we're seriously impressed with how well actors perform and how well they let us split this problem up, uh, split a programming problem up and move it into unique pieces separated by thin, simple interfaces. Um, what kind of actors are we looking at? Well, I, we're looking at Akka a lot, but we're really also interested in some of the research projects going on, like Project Orleans, which came out of Microsoft Labs, of all places, um, where they have a concept of an actor that isn't just a running instance, but it's a label. And that actor doesn't have to actually exist until you call it, but it'll come back up with state and everything and then go back away. We're fascinated with this idea, and uh, we really want to see where we can take this in our system. And finally, well, not finally, but we have more to go. Um, the next, we want to apply this to client development. Now, we've had good luck on the server side by breaking our system up into these small atomic units because, frankly, we have a 1,000 servers anyway, so let's break them up and use different languages in different places. On the clients, that's a little harder to do. You know, you're running a single process on somebody's cell phone, or maybe you're wearing a single process plus a background process plus something that talks to the watch. But you know what I mean. You're running a single blob of code, typically written in a single language. So all of our rules for promoting um, development on the back end, we can't use the same way on the front end, but we're now looking at how, we, how do we find those forcing functions in client code that will give us some of the same benefits. So. If on the back end, our universal API is REST over, uh, JSON over HTTP requests, what is our universal kind of glue that we're going to use on the client side? We're still working on this, but we're, we're really thinking about it hard. And then finally, now that we've learned how to do this massively polyglot immutable infrastructure thing, um, sorry, I had to whip out the big words because it sounds really fun when you say it that way. Um, we're trying to see what the lessons are. And maybe it's time to go full circle. Maybe it's time to start looking more at different ways of gluing these pieces together that aren't just requiring different languages but work in a different way. Um, I can't remember who it was that said this, but I remember somebody saying that microservices are a poor man's implementation of a good Erlang actor system. right? And I think there's a lot of truth in this because in an actor system where you're passing these small messages around, you, can get, you, you really decompose the system quickly. And maybe there's a lot of more truth there than we ever anticipated. Now, from all of this, what, 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 what is it that I want you guys to take out of this? I've spent a lot of time talking about 
what we do at Wonderlist, and hey, you know, it could come off as how cool we are. We use 23 languages, and we have all this stuff, and it's very cool. And I, every time I describe it, I, it is a little impressive what we've done. But there's a core lesson beyond, below all of that that I think is really important, and I wish all of you to take it with you into whatever your practice you're developing. And that's something that comes out of extreme programming way back before Agile, way back before a lot of these other things came along. And that's this concept that if something is difficult, do it all the time and get really good at it. So when I came into Wonderlist a year and a half ago, they had already started breaking the hairball that was their previous system. And the way they did it was by attacking everything that was keeping them from making it better. They, were, they had a fear of deployment, so they attacked it, and they made it to where we deploy all the time. They, have a f they had a fear of using different languages, so we use lots of different languages now. And over that process, we've gotten really good at it. Now, the question I would ask you in any kind of Q&A about what you're doing with your own companies is what is it that you find hard to do in your company? What is it that you find hard to do in your development practices? What do you find hard about making code that goes out and runs all the time and does so bulletproof? What is it that's really tough? Go practice it. Go do it all the time. If it is something as simple as deployment, make yourself deploy every four hours. Put a cron job that kills off servers and, and, and puts these things out. Or if it's something different, if it's, if it's you need to figure out how to actually perform under load, build the things that will kill your system under load and then do it all the time. Or any number of things. Like I'm trying to think of something for our, our friends at, at, at Undead, and what do they find that hard? Like what do you find the hardest thing right now in your own practice, just to get this interactive? We wrote uh, a headless game client to stress the servers and load them. And right. Then, um, as you were looking at, uh, how do you stress the servers and load them? Yeah. Uh, it was pretty Right. So one of their big chi challenges is how to scale up and down and restrict in, 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 in in um, response to customer demand. And you know, the answer, that the, the, the reply I would say is, get good at that, right? Make it, for, find the thing that forces your system to always have to be constantly looking at its load and scaling itself, and then implement that. So then you don't have to do it again. And with that, as if anybody has questions, I, I see a hand right back here. There's some microphones. Yeah. You've talked about uh, many languages and, in fact, uh, ability to do anything in any language, as, as, as you know. My question is about entry, co entry cost, yes, because uh, what is uh, the path to, uh, to create the appropriate uh, quality of code? What is the problem with reinvent the wheel in each language, for example? create the supportive libraries, and what is the path to, uh, to achieve appropriate level of competence in each, in each language, and what is the evolution of this, of this set of languages? Because, for example, if you have 20 languages, what mm -hmm. is the evolution of these languages and the usage in the, in the company uh, at the time? Those are, those are really good questions. So, several, and several parts to the answer. The first is, as much as we want people to experiment with new languages, we do want things to work well. So we do make people prove it a bit. We make, if somebody wants to write something in Rust, for example, Rust just having gone 1.0 and everybody's like, ooh, Rust is the new hotness. We have a few people on our team like that. Um, that's great, right? The first thing we're asking people to do is actually write something that emulates what we already know how to do and really find out how good is it or not, and can we run it in our, in our system. And usually it takes a little while to answer all of those questions, um, but so far we haven't run into something that we can't do that. The second is make sure other people in the company actually like the language. We don't require everybody in our company to know every language. That would be ridiculous, and it's actually a little bit um, sometimes brutal on the brain, like, you know, having learned all these languages in the last few years, in addition to my core stable, um, it, your brain actually kind of turns to jello a little bit after over time, so I don't want all of my engineers learning every single language. 
But we do try to make sure that people, we have multiple people on the team that understand a language before we actually commit to it in production. Um, and a good example of this is our Haskell service that we've written, this root uh, service. Um, we have several people in the company that put in the time and investment to actually make sure, this, once we tested it out and found it was fast, they put the time and investment to make sure that it was going to have everything that we needed around it. And then we also look at the long-term trade-offs of this. So with this Haskell app, we actually haven't changed the code on it in eight months. And that's because it, got, it proved itself to be so rock solid in the first place that we can now get away with the idea that if something happens and we lost our two people with Haskell knowledge, um, somebody else in the team that knows Go could replace that in a day. So we, we arbitraged a risk of using all these languages a little bit by keeping to these smaller, uh, more manageable pieces. Um, I think I got to all the pieces of your question, did I? Ah, the cost of the organization. Yes, you're right. So the cost of the or to the organization um, is something that we've had lots of conversations about. Chad, our CTO, has really put a mandate on we want to make sure programmers are happy in their job and happy with the tools that they use. And if that means that we have to spend some time actually figuring this out and it means that we're actually spending money on, the, those, programmer time, on those programmer hours to find how something works, um, that's okay. So, yes, we do actually spend more money on just overhead and time because we put in the effort into all these languages, but we're doing so in part not just for all the benefits I talked about, but for another important benefit, which is programmer happiness. We want to make sure that people feel like they can do something in our organization and they don't have to leave our organization to go play with the the things they really want to play with. One of the, one of the ways um, we put this is we don't want people sitting around a water cooler going, man, wouldn't it be cool if, right? Our challenge to those people is, yeah, it would be cool. Go find out if we can do it for real, right? Now, obviously, there, there are intersections of reality that happen with this. Like if we're in crunch mode and the shit's hitting the fan and everything's going crazy, people are pretty cognizant that they shouldn't be necessarily spending too much time putting effort into, uh, into um, these things that may or may not work out. But on the other hand, when we do have time, we, we spend the time, and we're happy to. Do you have any service ownership issues, and is there abundant services in your company? Uh, I'm sorry, the first part was? Is there s any service ownership issues? Service ownership issues. Um, Mm, sometimes <laughs> is the honest answer. Um, how we handle this logistically is that pretty much everybody owns everything. By making these things easy to kill and replace, we have made sure that for the most part, when anybody is serving in an operational role, like we're having a problem, a service is having a problem, even if they didn't write the code, we're pretty comfortable with them deploying new, new versions of that, of that infrastructure easily and quickly. And so that's kind of broken down some of the ownership issues that we, we've had that might, might crop up. Um, and then going on the flip side of that, the teams that actually put each piece into production, um, they do kind of have an ownership role. So like I'm lead of the integrations team right now, and we have several services that we're putting out for the first time. And it's my team's job to keep them going. And so we do have an ownership stake there. And we have to fight this uphill, well, not fight, but we have to work this uphill by going to other people in the group, in the other teams, and saying, okay, here's what we're deploying, here's how it works, so that anybody who has responsibilities for the running system, they know what's going on. So it is a, there is a tension there that we have, um, but it hasn't been a problem, so to speak. Uh, I'd like to ask you about the testing. Um, are you using some... Uh, how are you make sure that the next deployment will not break your ecosystem with uh, all these components? Are you using staging environment with all this ecosystem or something like that? Our, our most frequent mode of testing is to deploy um, canaries in the coal mine and see how they do and then push them from there. Um, again, it comes to this balance of 
We make sure that our, does each server is small enough to understand. We make sure it's tested well enough that we understand what's going on with it. And we make sure everybody is involved with that service has a chance to review those changes before we, we put them in flight. Um, but then we put them in flight. Um, we don't yet have a concept of a totally independent staging environment from our production environment. When our coders work, because everything is boiled down to small enough pieces, we actually are, we have and promote people deploying straight to production. And that means that if you, for example, were on my team and you're launching something, that means you're on the hook, right? You better make sure it's going to, it's going to get, get in there and take flight and go. Now, that means that you're likely to do all sorts of testing first, even if it's not strict TDD or set testing, you're going to be testing your own stuff. And second, when you do have something big coming in that's new, that means everybody's going to be taking a look. But again, what we really focus on first is actually getting load into things and looking at metrics and seeing what's happening and then being able to pull back very quickly if something's not quite right. Okay, so as I understand, uh, you are not executing uh, the test for all uh, ecosystem during the each deployment stage. No, in fact, we don't have a deployment stage for the entire system. The system as a whole, since we launched it um, in last July, has been down in total um, twice. Once was because we had uh, S the SSL stuff that happened and we took everything offline intentionally. Another time was because um, we had an RDS crash and we had to take everything off. And, um, but other than that, we actually don't stage out the entire system at once. Everything is always these small pieces that are going into play. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we do it on, we do it live. Okay, thanks. How many what? How many services do we run? Do we run? Um, I actually, honestly, I would have to like poke around in our system with grep a little bit and do some counts. Um, off the top of my head, we have 30 or 40 primary services running at any one time. Um, and those are running across 400 to 600 Amazon instances of servers. So it's... Uh, it's big. As you use a lot of services and they talk over uh, HTTP and REST, uh, there's natural network overhead. Mm -hmm. And if there are a lot of those services, how do you manage overall performance of the whole system? We thought that was going to be a huge problem to be honest, right? That was one of our big unknowns when we drove through, everything's gonna be JSON over HTTP. And we're actually sure it is a problem in some respects. Like we probably are running more instances than we would have other, use, otherwise using some other um, architecture for getting the messages around. Um, I said just a minute ago, we're running hundreds of instances of Amazon. Some percentage of that, probably very measurable, is because we're using this inefficient protocol between the pieces. Um, but the metric that we were actually more interested about was latency. And what we found is no matter what scale our system is running at, as long as everything's green, um, the latency through the system is measured in tens of milliseconds. So even with all the connections going back and forth between the servers, we're seeing excellent latency. And that was what we cared about first. Second, is, okay, how do we not spend so much money on Amazon? And this is, this is a cycle that we're, we're, we're entering into right now. And so in the near future, we very well may change our rule about everything needs to be JSON over HTTP. And we may say everything needs to be JSON over HTTP2 between our systems in the back end. Or we may say everything needs to be JSON that's being shipped around as AMP, AMQP messages so that we can use persistent connections and load balancing that way. So yes, we're, we're, we're looking at that, but our primary metric for performance wasn't total number of systems in use, it was about the latency. And for that, it works. Thank you. Oh, another hand over here. And we'll come this way, I promise. Uh, I'd like to uh, split the word DevOps uh, for a minute. Uh, you make uh, developers happy. They have uh, new toys in their sandbox and uh, they're really happy. What about operations, uh, about making uh, the whole environment uh, secure and updated? Um, 
Well, our developers are part of that process too. Um, we actually don't have a separate operations team. So to help keep things secure, um, we have a couple of people that are very much tasked with security first, but they're also, they also develop code and they also deploy. Um, when it comes to like a lot of the SSL stuff, I mean, that's, that's things that I get personally involved into, even writing features. So yes, we're keeping developers happy, but we're also, we make them do every bit of the operations um, that we have in our system. So are, are they happy with that? <laughs> Most of them. Um, we have a couple of people who aren't as strong at firefighting, like when crises happen. Like in any system like this, you're going to have the times when the shit hits the fan, something's going wrong, RDS crashes on you, you exceed or you, you simply exceed the, the amount of traffic you've ever seen before. And we have people that are somewhat better at this than others in our, in a, in our organization. And that's fine. I mean, it's... Um, some people are natural slow thinkers where they'll like think through a problem really deeply, like you know your brain surgeons. You want them to think through your problem very deeply. And there's other people who are a little more natural at the trauma stuff. So somebody comes into an ER and they're good at that. We have we have that spectrum across our team. For the most part, we recognize that. And when we have people that are doing that need to address the trauma situations um, and that are good at it we try to backfill that and make sure that they get time off and they get some rest and relaxation and we make sure to help that out. And so far it hasn't been an issue. If we grow much larger, this is where I'm going to be fascinated if we can continue to maintain this. Um, I think we can, but the question will be how big. So right now we have almost 70 employees. Um, half of our team is developers and um, most of them are involved with operations on one level or another, and we'd like to keep it that way, but that's an open question mark. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I said this way, but there's... Oh, back in the back. Yep, microphone's coming. Is it? Can we pass it back? So much easier when it comes over to Mike. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I have a question when it comes to your heterogeneous approach yes. to, to technology. Uh, basically, are you also infrastructure provider independent? How easy it would, would be for you to move out from Amazon? Right now, at this moment, if you said we had to move off Amazon to go to DigitalOcean or something else, uh, it'd be a little hard for us, to be honest, because we use RDS for um, our database instances and because we actually use SQS and some of the other Amazon services, we do have a strong tie to our provider that we're not entirely happy with. And that's not to say we're not happy with Amazon. Amazon we're happy with, we have a great relationship with, we're, 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 you know, they've been there for us when we've needed them to be. Um, but one of our goals over the next six months will be to become uh, infrastructure independent and that work is being taken on by a couple of people on the team who really care about this and they're pushing it forward. So, so waiting for the next presentation about this. Exactly. So if I come back in a year, we'll probably talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> Another question here. Uh, yeah, I have a question because... oh, microphone. Uh, so I have a question about like versioning your application and versioning contracts between application. Yes. Because you said you have only you ha only have uh, one fully functional environment. Right. So how do you manage uh, new features which break the contract and and so on? So um, okay. So in order to pull this off, no tool that's out there like Chef or Puppet or anything else could do what we needed it to do. So we ended up building our own tool that we call Wake. Um, and hopefully someday somebody will come up with something a lot like it because we'd like not to have our own tools like this. But it does several things for us. Um, it makes sure that we have a stack of images for each application and service, and we have a command line interface where we can, when we deploy a service, we're actually using this intermediate service to deploy them, and we can pu pull them back and replace them with previous AMIs and the whole nine yards across this entire fleet of stuff. Um, and the reason Chef or Puppet wouldn't work, work for us is because they look at systems as a complete whole and we're looking at them as very specific items. So as far as what happens when somebody breaks contracts, um, again, that comes down to making sure that the right kind of tests are being done before we push them in and then canarying them 
and if there's any issue, pulling back immediately. Like, how do they test it? Like, if they build their own environments and right. isolate only the services which, which changed something? Um, more to the point, since everything in and out of a service is REST and JSON, the, the typical approach to testing is to play JSON into, um, into the service and then see what you get back out of it and to do that back and forth. That's, that's the most typical approach to testing that we have. And, and do you mean manage some kind of like documentation or some system to like keep schemas in sync between services? Like how, how the service know uh, what's the current API? What's the current API? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a lot of bookkeeping. Um, <laughs> we don't have a formalized system uh, for that other than writing it down and communicating it um, because we're quite frankly scared of, of stuff that gets too complicated, <laughs> XML schema and all that kind of thing. Uh, we, are, we are looking at moving more into JSON schema to validate our messages. And one of the things that the, the, the our QA team is looking at doing more of, they already have systems that do regular tests on the API on a consistent basis. So whenever the API starts acting up, we get notifications in our Slack channels, and you know, we have little sirens going off, and Terminator instances like saying weird shit to us. But, um, but we're, we want to expand this to actually start sampling out the messages and b going between different layers and checking them against JSON schemas so that we know for sure that things are doing what we, we think they're doing. Um, but part of it is also a little bit of Postal's law in, in application. Um, we make sure that we're only adding to our payloads, we're not subtracting, and we're making sure that anything that gets something it doesn't understand in a payload just like goes, oh, I don't get this and doesn't actually die. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, anybody else? Oh, question over here, way over there. Uh, I have the question about how are you managing to monitor your s uh, microservices? You have multiple instances, multiple services. And how do you know, for example, one of them is mi misbehaving? You have to right. uh, shut it down or something like that. How do we manage that? Um, we have a, we instrument the heck out of these uh, services. So each service is um, an Ubuntu VM and it's running statsd that's collecting all sorts of stuff off of it. That all reports to Librato so we can see all the metrics for each service aggregated together. Um, and then we also are pulling live data off of our load balancers. And so we're, that's where we're monitoring status codes and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, basically, if there's a system um, hook for monitoring something, we have that inserted into the OS and pulling off data to Librato and big colorful graphs that show us what's going on. Yeah, we all of them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think we made it all the way around the room. So um, if you have more questions, I will be here for the rest of the day. Please don't hesitate. Yeah, thank you for your lecture.